let's get started since we have lots to discuss and lots of you. So we're really excited with that. Um, and hopefully we can um, get to all of the questions and all of the issues on your mind today. Hopefully they have something to do with starting solids, but if they don't, we can talk about anything you wanna talk about. The off topic is also allowed. Um, I'm Marielle Benjamin. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm the director of groups at Cooper. I am also mother to Maddie making the kissy face in front and Lucas behind her. Today is day two of Lucas being in school. He is nine and um, Madeline is 11. So I have not started solids in a few years, but luckily I do this professionally. So hopefully um, we'll get to everything that you guys wanna talk about today. And I am so lucky to have two wonderful co-hosts with me today from NARA Organics and Little Spoon. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Cooper, and then they are going to jump on and tell you about their wonderful brands. We are a uh, virtual parenting home base. Our um, main feature are monthly parenting groups where you get paired with a facilitator like me, and you join a group of parents parenting in the same age and stage as you and matched around criteria that matter the most to you. And you follow this journey together, talking about development, developmental stages, problems, issues, questions, all together as a group and learn and support each other. Um, we also do incredible assemblies like this and lots of other support, weekly office hours to drop in with parenting questions, all the things. And hopefully if you're new to Cooper, you'll check us out afterwards and I will get the privilege of doing a talk like this and a group with you sometime soon. And Joni, can I pass it to you? Sure, let me just make sure I'm unmuted. Hi, I'm Joni, the brand marketing manager here at NARA Organics, a new baby formula based on organic whole milk. Thank you to Cooper for having us. Uh, we're, we've done a couple of these before in the past together, and we always enjoy learning about all things parenting and sharing our experiences. A quick background for about us, our founder and CEO, CEO Esther, started NARA after her daughter was born and she couldn't find a formula that she wanted to use, even amongst the organic ones. And so she began working with nutritionists, pediatricians, and scientists to create a new baby formula uh, based on the incredible nutrition um, found in organic whole milk, especially whole milk fats. And it takes a while to create a new baby formula, so almost five years now. So during that time, Esther created the NARA Baby Tracker app to help keep track of all things baby, uh, feeding, um, sleeping, diapers, growth, medications, milestones, pumping, you name it, you can track it. Uh, we also have a feature that tracks solids, uh, which is super relevant to today's talk. Uh, I use the app with my two babies and it was such a great tool. You know, it was basically like my brain for me during those first years of being super sleep deprived. So help me track everything. I, I'll link it in the chat or the Q and A if I can figure out which one if the chat is working, I'll link it. It's free to use, um, easy to download, no ads. So as a mom and also someone that's really interested in infant nutrition, I'm really looking forward to our talk, talk today. Yay, thank you. And then Karen, if you wanted to introduce Little Spoon. Yeah, absolutely. So we are also very excited about today's talk. It is super relevant to what we do at Little Spoon. Um, Little Spoon is the, um, the first and only platform that is really um, helping the parent start and stick with um, a food brand that um, really meets their standard. So we have a range of products starting with our baby blends line. That line has six stages and it is built specifically for starting solids. So from the very first bites of those single purees and early exploration through to more advanced textures, whole foods, um, a wide range of over a hundred um, different ingredients to really diversify the palate. That um, is the kind of essence of the Baby Blends line um, built with um, the support of experts in the baby space. We also then offer a line that transitions you into table foods, really um, kind of an early 
um, transition meal offering called Biteables, um, and then graduate you into a line of different um, heat and eat meals, as well as um, our smoothies. You can see some of that on this slide. And really the brand um, is built on the philosophy that parents deserve convenient, easy to use, high quality options. Um, unfortunately, not so many of those options um, exist even today at the grocery store. And so what we do is we work really closely with you to personalize a menu that makes sense for your child based on their eating stage and deliver it right to your door. Um, those products actually evolve and develop alongside your child. So we kind of continue to advance the meals that your child is eating as your child um, ages. And beyond that, um, we always like to say we like to give the products and also the tools. So things like today's um, incredible conversation um, is a great um, example of some of what we do at Little Spoon. We have a panel of different experts that are available for questions um, to help you along the way. We have a customer service team that will work with you on menu curation, kind of you name it. We're really there for you, um, really offering the resources alongside the products as your child grows up with Little Spoon. So really happy to be here today. So cool. I am so excited about both of these brands and to be able to recommend them. And then these little finger biteable boxes are so I feel like I would steal that from my child and eat it as my snack. If only my lunch looked that organized or if I remember to eat lunch, which is a whole nother thing. Um, so great. So we're going to get into what we're going to talk about today, which is really the starting point for solids. I hope and if if you are out there and you have started solids and you have questions about feeding moving forward, of course, we can answer and address those. We're just going to start with sort of this beginning of the journey. And what is your role as a parent in this journey besides providing the food, obviously, um, knowing how and when to begin, some of the different approaches, things to watch out for, and then really importantly, the part that is most informed by the research, which is establishing good mealtime habits. So just so you know, two sort of disclaimers from today, our mission at Cooper is to present the research about child development, how children grow and thrive, and what we know from data. It, of course, is not going to be my opinion, although I'm happy to also give you my opinion on things. But I want you to know where there is evidence, we'll talk about it. And where there isn't evidence, we can talk about practical solutions. Um, I also want to say, if you have a concern about your baby's specific medical history or weight gain or your family history or something like that, I don't want you to take anything of what we say today and run with it without checking with your healthcare provider. There are, of course, other components to starting solids than just the behavioral stuff and the, the parent-led stuff we're going to talk about today. So if there are any questions in that realm, make sure to run it by the provider that knows your family and your child best. So welcome to the next phase of your child's development, um, which is eating. So it's really easy to get caught up on the what's going in, what's coming out part of eating. But really, I want you to think of your role in this transition as creating a positive environment, creating a association that your children will have for the rest of their lives with meal, not in a pressure, scary way, in a wonderful way with meal times. So Food is so much about culture, about tradition, about love, about connection. When we look at the data about why family meals are so important for children throughout the lifespan, it has much more to do with the connection and the coming together that happens at meals, the ritual of that, than it does with actual calories in, right? So something really helpful at the beginning of this journey is to really set your mind to instead of think about this is a task this is a to do this is a must calculate how many things i get in you a day this is also the beginning of teaching your children about all of the wonderful community and ritual and tradition that exists around meals and we know that the way our children's brains work is that the more we can have that positive association, not only the better we'll see their behavior around meals and the way they approach food and even try new foods, but also the way that they will come to understand eating and healthy eating specifically for the rest of their lives. So these associations in this early phase really matter. Now, the good news is that your children at this transition are still largely dependent on formula or breast milk or both for their calories. So that's another reason that this is about less pressure, having fun and having this opportunity to 
introduce something really wonderful and glorious in their life like food. So in the beginning, I want you to think of starting solids as science class. This is baby science, right? This is learning about different textures, different tastes, what it feels like to hold things, what it is to develop fine motor skills, what it's like to throw things on the floor and see what noise they make or who comes to clean them up, right? The knocking things down over and over again is part of this process. And so one of the things is looking for the opportunities for connection, for joy, for delight, for all of those really important, really meaningful relationship building moments around the food. And letting some of the other stuff like the mess and the chaos and the just the sheer overwhelming nature of how many crevices and cracks food can get into go right because if we can maintain that positive sort of openness around this process we're going to do a lot of good for both our children and for ourselves as parents so in this back and forth conversation of what are what is eating going to look like in for your baby and for you readiness is one of the most important things to look at so right now the current recommendations and they do change with time like all things are generally between four and six months babies are ready to start solids and i see some people raising their hands but if you want to put your question in the q a we're going to circle back to that if that's easier perhaps you're you are unable to mute yourself, but you like disappear on my screen after a second. So I'm gonna leave the hands raised for the moment and just put your questions in Q&A or save them for the end. I'm not ignoring you, I promise. Okay, so back to readiness. So usually it's doubling your baby's birth weight. It's being at least 13 pounds or greater. And really importantly, it's having these basic skills, which is being able to sit up well supported with head control in a high chair, right? Being able to show evidence of swallowing, not having other issues while using bottles or breast milk that anybody's concerned about, some ability to pick things up if you're going to go right into finger foods, such as baby led weaning, and some curiosity and interest about food, which is really just being awake and alert enough to want to participate. So very often babies who are on the cusp of being ready and interested in food are the ones who, while you are eating dinner, are doing that. That's a very scientific move for opening their mouths and coming very close to you or attempting to eat your food, right? Curiosity and interest and thinking through readiness as something that also has a lot to do with when you are ready, right? So in terms of the data, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest early or any particular point in time, except around the introduction of allergens. So as many of you may be aware, it was common thinking a few years ago to hold off on foods that could be responsible for allergies. And now we are realizing that the early introduction can actually be better for babies. And so the recommendations have shifted younger, which is why we got into the four to six month age window. However, if you are not ready, if you say to me, it's four months, but I'm still totally overwhelmed. I don't have a schedule that I can work with. I don't think I can add solid food on top of all of the things that I'm doing. And we have this challenge and that challenge and all this else going on. There's absolutely nothing to suggest that if you waited till five months, there's any difference. Or if you're five months and you wait till six months. I famously with my second child was going on vacation and said, I just, I can't deal with food till I get back. So you're going to wait another month because that's what's going to work for me. So it needs to also be when you're prepared to start this journey and when you can do it from, again, that place of being positive, being open and being relaxed about it. So in terms of what gets paired with readiness, um, we think about the equipment and all of the things that are marketed to you to use for feeding. And while lots of them are great and lots of them are great, the things you basically need to start with is having a high chair that your baby can sit in or some kind of booster that has foot support so your children can be in their best possible position to be able to chew to chew and swallow you want to think about things like bibs and mats that catch some of the excess of all of the mess that you're going to make you need some utensils even the smallest babies even if you're doing purees and you're feeding them are going to want to start with utensils at least to hold and bang on the high chair i'm sure all of you who have started can relate on the using them as musical instruments instead of as devices to actually get the food in their mouth but having those suction cup bowl or some kind of plate bowl combination that can stay on their high chair or for you to portion things out like you saw in those um 
beautiful little spoon pictures, but having something like that, small storage containers. So if you are making food or saving food, you have little tiny ways to do that. And then some device, if you're cooking your own food, you might want to have a blender or a steamer specifically for baby food. And finally, if you are a person who loves recipe books, and this is going to help you be able to feed the whole family the same meal, or that is part of where you're going to figure out how you introduce cumin into a baby's diet, go ahead and get a family friendly or baby toddler specific recipe book. Other than that, in terms of all the things they're not as important, but again, if you love them and you want to get them, I'm sure that they're great. The other big thing to talk about is drinking water. So the introduction to solids is also the introduction to having water during meals, and you want to do that in a cup. And as the Cooper uh, Cooperative, which is our WhatsApp chain with all our Cooper members, where I think some of our members give the best advice there is, but the talk of what kind of straw cup people are using or regular cup could go for days or weeks or months. That's how much variety there is in finding the right cup. It's it's like finding a spouse. It's that, it's that tricky to figure out which one you like, which one doesn't leak, which one your baby actually drinks from. So remembering that for the uh, muscles in the mouth and for the soft palate, you want to move away from a nipple like or sippy cup design and you want to look for either a straw cup or a cup cup like what I don't know what the cup cup is called that's just a cup right but lots of different options exist but remembering to introduce water at the same time. And my best professional advice is that also you might want to get a dog because if you don't like having the food all over the floor dogs are a really convenient way to solve that so another thought you can say you went to this parenting talk today you're going to start solids and so it's also time to get a family pet but they're very helpful um okay so now we're going to start and what method are we going to use so there's lots of talk about different methods proving themselves out in data. There is purees are more gentle, they're easier to start, they help you develop more individual tastes on a baby's palate versus baby led weaning, they get better fine motor control, they have more self regulation. In the research, none of this has really panned out that there is a big difference between which method you choose. Instead, what we see is that a blended approach or an approach that feels right to you or whatever feels like it fits your lifestyle most is going to be the most successful. So we're going to talk through the difference between starting with purees or starting with baby led weaning, but a combination approach is totally acceptable. One over the other, totally acceptable. There isn't a right or wrong here. But what there is, is really considering, again, what's right for your family. Who's going to be doing the feeding? Who's going to be doing the meal prep? What kind of temperament does your baby have? So temperament, and I know we don't have a ton of time to get into all topics today, but is also just the general way in which your baby approaches the world. Are they going to be an enthusiastic eater? Are they going to take more time to warm up? Are they going to be a little bit more cautious? All of that has a lot to do with what method you might choose. If they are only interested in what's on your plate, that eating the same meals from the start may make a lot of sense for you. If they're much more hesitant to try new things, then having more simple purees may make more sense that an adult can help them eat, right? So thinking that through and being adjustable and adaptable as they change and grow and as you learn about each other in that two-way conversation um, can help you have the most successful strategy for eating. So with that said, let's talk a little bit about purees. So purees are obviously adult led because they begin with you feeding your child, even though you are going to try to make it more of a dance where you feed a bite and your child feeds a bite and you feed a bite and your child feeds a bite. And when I say bite, a lot of it is not gonna get in their mouth. A lot of it is not actually going to be digested. It is about experimentation and it is about play. Let's remember that quantities are very, 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 very small because as we said, they're having breast milk or formula for their nutrition. So there isn't an issue with, oh my goodness, they need to eat food. So if a little bit gets on their lips and you think they maybe sort of kind of licked a little and maybe they swallowed, that's gonna be success, right? Here, the bar is super low. Even as you continue to offer, and you're, as your child gets older, obviously, and you're offering more, it's not always about the volume that they're taking. It's really not about volume 
maybe forever, but for a long time, it's much more, again, about that attitude, about that positive association. So one of the benefits of purees is that it allows you to try a lot of things. You can mix a lot of things together. You can be more adventurous in terms of ingredients that you blend together. And it allows you some sense of control about how much your baby might actually be eating or in what order you are offering things. Now, you don't need to be in control of how much they are eating or what you are offering. But if that's important to you, that's important to know about yourself and say, that makes me feel really good. I like when I have a container and I can see the jar disappear. Or I like when I know we did one thing at a time because it made me feel better. On the other hand, with purees, you do need to make sure, and I think as Karen mentioned, that you continue to increase texture and that you think about having little lumps and having more gradation in how much they're eating at a time so that you're not just having kids who are eating, you know, almost liquidy pouches and not practicing chewing and using all of the other small muscles in their mouth. You also need to make sure by eight months you are introducing finger foods if you start with purees because so much about the grasp, starting with raking, learning how to do a pincer grasp, which is actually a pre-literacy skill because eventually the tripod grasp and learning how to write, you need to develop all of those muscles. So finger foods are really important. So if you do start with purees, you'll have to add them as you go. Um, but it's completely an option and a perfectly fine way to go. In terms of other things you might have heard, the three-day rule, we used to inter introduce one food at a time for three days before we moved on to another. Unless you have a significant reason to worry that your child has a particular allergy, that rule has kind of gone out the window. So you can mix right from the beginning if that's what you're interested in doing. And you can also now introduce, we're gonna talk about allergens again later, but you can introduce almost anything that you can think of blending into a puree. So some of the really sticky foods are hard to get in there, but otherwise there's lots of opportunity to put things into purees. Okay, I apologize that I'm just talking at you for so long, but hopefully then we'll be able to get to the questions and there are so many of you, so I'm looking forward to hearing what they all are. Um, so baby led weaning being another really popular, increasingly popular method, usually six months or above, babies are a little bit older and actually able to participate in doing the grasp. Some of the advantages are eating what the rest of the family is eating, being able to have that meal prep um, lightened a little bit because you don't need to make individual purees. Um, and again, some amount of self-regulation. So when babies are feeding themselves, and I should have flagged that one thing to look out for for purees is not force feeding. So just because you're doing more of it, you're not trying to force your children to eat beyond their interests. And for baby led weaning, one of the advantages is that if you are allowing them to do it on their own and they're not interested and they stop, you can follow their lead more easily, right? It's, it's a little bit clearer when they're done stopping. Um, there is always the concern of more choking that has not played out in the research. There is potentially more gagging involved in baby led weaning because they are working to figure out the food in their mouth and how much to take off at one time. But again, no correlation in the data between higher incidences of choking around baby led weaning than there is around purees. Um, again, if it feels to you like meal prep wise and culturally and with the, the way that your family is designed that this would be easier, it's a great choice. If it doesn't feel like it's a great choice for you, then you don't have to do it. There's gonna be a lot of that today. So hopefully that's reassuring. So now the next question that we always get, which is what foods should I start with? So again, there's absolutely no science to suggest that you should start with one food over another. We used to think that, and people will still tell you, if you start with the sweet foods, they'll never go backwards, but none of that has ever been proven out in research. So it can be whatever foods you have available, whatever foods are in season, whatever you order from Little Spoons, right? It doesn't really matter what you decide to choose and the order in which you do it. If you like something that's really prescriptive and you want to follow a guide, there are so many that you can find and you just pick one that feels like it resonates with you and you can do it that way. But otherwise, there isn't a lot of science about what you should start with. You do want to think about as you're you know, engaging your baby that every food can take up to 15 times for your baby to decide whether or not they like it. So frequency in reintroducing a food that's been rejected is really important. So go ahead and offer something many, many, many times in your rotation before you decide that this is a food that nobody's eating. And even for older kids, as we get into and, and happy to talk about picky eating and other things as kids age, but 
even for older children, just because a food isn't successful a lot doesn't mean it should ever disappear. We want to continue to offer our children a wide variety of food, even if they choose not to eat it over and over. Okay. So then thinking about some of the things to watch out for in general, and these are broad. Um, so obviously choking, the toilet paper roll test, if you've ever heard of that, anything that can fit inside a toilet paper roll is a choking hazard. Thinking of cutting things to be appropriately bite-sized, things that can be squished, things that can be gummed, making sure that an adult is with your child while they're eating, making sure how they're doing along the way in terms of being able to chew and swallow, and of course, alerting your physician to any questions that you have about what they look like while they're eating or any signs of distress. In terms of allergens, with the exception of cow's milk, like straight cow's milk, not all dairy, but straight cow's milk and honey, there are no longer recommendations about things that you need to avoid. If you have a family history of allergens, then that's something that you want to talk to an allergist about before you introduce them. But there are now many, many, many creative ways to introduce some of the top offending allergens really early and a lot of data to suggest that early exposure actually helps reduce the likelihood of allergies as kids grow. Of course, again, if there's anything you're specifically concerned about, that's a great question to bring to your provider or to the allergist. We can't do a talk on starting solids without talking about stress. So Obviously, parents are always trying to do their best, always wanting to. There's so many of you on this call who are interested and motivated and want to learn and want to do it the right way, even when I tell you there's no right way. But the pressure and stress that we can bring into this experience with our children is definitely something that they pick up on and react to. And if we make eating about a power struggle between control of your desperation to get them to eat it and their refusal to do so, we create a power dynamic between parents and children that isn't terribly healthy for eating and in general. So as much as we can, I want to encourage you to think, especially in this first year, of food as fun, of mealtimes as this exploratory, open communication time, as having the joy of connection way, 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 way above the actual food. When you give off that stress, when you parent from a place of that stress, your children are more likely to react negatively to it and to also have that association with meals, which we see down the line to have all kinds of things to do with disordered eating, unhealthy eating, obesity, and lots of other different connections around that. In terms of picky eating, so it's developmentally appropriate between 18 and 36 months for your children to all of a sudden refuse to eat things they were eating before. That's an absolutely appropriate developmental phase. It doesn't mean you didn't do anything wrong. It doesn't mean you didn't introduce enough variety in their diet early on. It is just a phase and largely about that power control dynamic that I just spoke about. It is fine for children to have repetitive choices in a world that can feel overwhelming to them as they learn new skills and do new things. Repetitive choices can feel safe and they can feel grounding. It there again, there is some data that some picky eaters are picky adult eaters, but that's okay too. We're all allowed to be who we are. You don't have to eat everything. So again, if it's not a nutritional concern, like they've eliminated an entire food group and we have no idea how you're going to get it, you can indulge choices here and there and continue to offer others that are rejected. So having preference is not a bad thing and it does not mean that there is something you know globally wrong with your child if you have any refusal aversions that you're actually really concerned about then again another opportunity to bring that to your provider and talk through it and then the last one is one of the most important which is adult modeling children learn to eat by watching you do it right very simply, they watch other people chewing and swallowing. They watch what you reach for. They watch how you cut. They watch how you use the spoon. They are learning through imitation. So having enough opportunity to watch adults eat is a really important part of learning. So one of the tips that we're going to have um, next, I'm just going to advance to that one, is Starting right now from the first day, or if you've already started from today, I want you to pull that high chair all the way up to a table, sit with your child or have another adult in the home sit with your child and eat at the same time as they are eating. 
now you're going to say, but I don't eat meals like that. And then I work and then I'm not home. Just find as many meals as possible, as many times a day as possible and eat something. If you can't eat the same food, you can have your tea and toast while your baby is eating something else. Totally fine. But you want to give them the experience of watching adults eat. And you want to give them the experience of what meals are all about, which is conversation. How was your day? What did you do today? Where did you go? What did you see? And we know because of language that you doing that sports casting is one of the most important ways we help kids to learn new vocabulary, right? So it's a two for one special. Have the meal together and do all of the talking. Is it a conversation with yourself largely? Of course. Do you feel like you're a little bit crazy? Sure, no problem. But get over that part and do it in the way that you would model a back and forth conversation with another adult or with an older child, right? And look for cues. Oh my goodness, how does that taste on your tongue? Oh, oh, look at that face. Was it a little bit spicy? Was it a little bit mushy, right? Imitate back. Give them the response and the feedback to what you know they're experiencing. When I respond to your face that you're making, to the way that you just threw your tongue out, to what you just threw across the floor in a normal conversational back and forth way. So not like, hey, no, we don't throw that, right? At this age, it's much more like, oh my goodness, were we, what was that? What just happened, right? So our reaction is small and it's back and forth so that they can have that moment with you. That connection is what we're talking about when you're going to read about all the importance of family meals. It's not going to be like, did you get two tablespoons of carrots in? And then did you get two tablespoons of apple, right? That is going to fall to the wayside. And I know that that feels really important now because it's what you can control and that's okay. But in the long run, what you're building is much more that back and forth relationship at meal times. So go ahead and start having it now. I also want you to think about using vocabulary to add new words to what they know. So as soon as early as eight months, your children understand a lot of language that they can't say back to you. But you can continue to increase that by saying something like, are those your bananas? Are bananas yellow? And are they sometimes mushy and sometimes hard? And are they big? Are they crunchy or are they mushy, right? All the different words you can talk about and introduce through having meals. Make sure to set yourself, your self and your child up for success by not trying to feed them when they're exhausted, right? They can guzzle a bottle or feed on a breast much more effectively when they're tired than they can have solids. So try to do it at a happy and well-rested time of day. You may need to plan a bath afterwards, which is okay. You may be like this lovely gentleman in the picture naked for mealtime. That's okay too, it, whatever your preference is, um, but you're eating together, you're having that experience and you're trying to find it at the best moments of the day. Let them explore, realize that all of the, the way that something feels to your fingertips when you touch it is the way it feels to your baby when they put something in their mouth, right? They have amazing, incredible receptors on in their lips and inside their mouth that can learn about an object and about the world by mouthing it. That's why they're putting everything in their mouths in these phases of development, right? So allow them the opportunity to learn from what's going in. Allow them the opportunity to learn what happens when it comes back out when you squish it between your fingers, when you rub it on the high chair, on yourself, on the wall, on everywhere. And I know that the mess is frustrating. And I know that food waste is a horrible reality that many people face in this, it, face in this phase, but as much as you can, try to feel okay about the mess and the exploration. Keep super calm. If you can't do it calmly, it's not worth doing for the meal times, right? So have somebody else do it if it's really stressing you out. I always say that as a parent, you have to pick the issues that really you allow to make you crazy, right? There, I, I'm sure I'm, I'm saying right, like I can see you nodding back, but there are only so many things that you can worry about. If choking is yours and you're trying baby led weaning and you just can't watch it because you're just scared of something, then have someone else help you through that stage if you can, right? So admit and understand where your weakness is, or maybe baby led weaning isn't your thing, if that's the case. Um, but try to keep calm when you can be. Trust your child, follow their lead, and really encourage independent eating. Again, there must be some type of finger food involved in your child's life by about eight months, if not before, and really thinking through giving them the opportunity to feed themselves as frustrating it as it is to sit there and watch them miss. You really wanna give them that opportunity for so many reasons. Okay, so we've made it through our slides and now we have lots of time for questions. Um, uh, 
um, I will do a scan of the Q&A. Joni, you had some questions too, if there's anything that you wanted to throw out that you guys collected. Really great presentation. I think there are a lot of questions. Um, you mentioned that formula feeding, or sorry, formula and breast milk is going to be their main source of nutrition during the beginning. Um, a lot of people are asking like what the order should be. Should when you feed always the formula first and should you wait an hour before you start the solids? Or um, I think that was what the my our pediatrician had you know suggested to us is that kind of the recommended order in how when to feed yeah there's so much variation so i don't know if it's recommended as much as i would think about when your child is waking up and the most voracious eater right you can't really start with like here's a little bite of this and a little bite of that that might be too much right so you might need to get that first formula or breast milk in and then an hour later maybe two hours later you can say it's breakfast time and let's see and then follow that up with your next feed depending how often you're doing feeding so that you can also top off the nutritional part with having that bottle or breastfeeding. So I always think like when they first wake up, if they're starving versus if they wake up from a nap and it's not time to eat again, those are good times to insert meals. When you're starting with solids, you can start one time a day, right? So there's no rule about that either. You could have one time a day that you try to get in a meal, or you could have three little times where you try to get in a couple of bites. Since the quantities are so small for so long, it really doesn't matter. And you need to figure out whatever's best for you. I know when you're dealing with how often they have to sleep and how often you have to do breast and bottle feeding, the idea of adding three meals and a snack is not what we're talking about for four to six months old. So pick up a moment in the day that feels doable with a little distance from the bottle or breast so that they're hungry, but something that also feels like it's manageable. I think that's a huge relief to a lot of first time parents to know that yes. you don't have to, you know, three meals, two snacks is just so much. So, so it's much. Just really just for the kids to the babies to experience food yes. or solids. Yes. Um, you can even forget a day. You can be traveling and be doing other things and you don't get to solids that day. And that's, that's okay, okay too. That's okay too. That's okay too. Um, um, okay, there's a specific peanut butter question that I see in here with a husband with an anaphylactic reaction. So that's one where I would definitely talk to an allergist or the pediatrician about how, with a family history, um, how they recommend doing it, especially around peanuts. Although there are so many new incredible ways to find small dosage of peanuts um, and, and nuts in general into baby's diets, but that would be one, Carly, I would want some supervision for. Oh, there's someone who loves the app, the Nara Baby app, shout out. Um, hi, Emily, he's not a fan of purees, trying to find different ways to start him because he's not a fan of purees. So my question, Emily, would be like, is he a fan of finger foods? Are there other things that he is eating? Because then maybe you have a child who does better starting with finger foods or starting with um, more texture or lumpier food. And again, a lot of that is just like, see how it goes and experiment with things that he's interested in. I wouldn't stop just because, and he's already seven months old in this question. So it's not like I would go backwards and say like, oh, well, you know, we've never been able to do purees. So we're still trying to master purees. If he's ready to move on to other things, then I would just follow his lead and move on. And again, as long as you're getting in all of the very diet that you want to do, you can do it in any form that works for him. And you have a lot more options at seven months. So that can be exciting. Here is a question. I want to get my son to start using the fork and spoon. You load the spoon and fork and try to get him to his mouth and he thinks it's a game, right? Okay. So for 14 months old, you can give him the fork and the spoon. And I promise you, he knows what he's supposed to do with them. It does not mean that he will be successful, but he knows what he's supposed to try. So I would do the one bite that you'll help him with and one bite he tries on his own and try to encourage him to get there. If he wants to use his hands, that's great. We also want him to use his hands and his fingers. So some combination, Delessa, if I'm saying your name at all correctly, I would do a combination of utensils, fingers, and you doing some feeding. But if the loading up and then him refusing to eat it has become a game, then you're right to say it is a game and it's only gonna work if you're playing it his way, right? So abandon, make that the fun game and then 
make something else the one that actually tries to get him to eat anything. And some adult modeling if he sees you doing it. For sure. The, the watching. That's why I say by 14 months, he definitely knows what he's supposed to do. He definitely has seen it enough to know that. Um, how do I introduce egg? My baby is almost seven months old. We gave her boiled egg. She got red rashes. I would definitely talk to the pediatrician about this one. And I don't, you know, that will they ever be able to eat egg? Again, we have so much research on small exposure over time being really helpful, but I wouldn't want to do it again without talking to somebody about that reaction and how they think you should do it. Sometimes you do the first couple introductions at the pediatrician's office or your family medicine provider's office so that they can observe the reaction. But there's no reason, Priscilla, to give up hope that you have a child that can eventually eat eggs. Um, but I would do that with a little bit of supervision involved. Okay, Grace is asking, does the baby have to be able to sit totally unsupported or as long as they can sit with some support, like the trip trap seat? So some support is fine, like, like a high chair is offering some amount of support but if it's not good head and neck control and if it feels like they could choke or gag if they weren't in the right position artificially then you might want to hold off grace just to make sure that you have a little bit more of that you know control and strength in going into eating so it is actually hard work for babies to be able to sit up and support themselves and there are ways that you can practice but if you've been using something um you know like a bumbo to hold them up and they haven't been working some of those core muscles on their own you may want to increase that before you start sitting for meals Nora is asking once you start solids you need to give them every day every meal once a day okay i think we answered that but lots of variety it can be every other day it can be once a day you can forget you can go on vacation you know whatever it is when you're talking about kids who are eating more substantial meals around a year uh, between nine months and a year you might have introduced more frequent times during the day that you're eating and have more meals then you might want to be able to pack snacks and things that are on the go but not in this introduction to solids at all um my son is almost 10 months old still on baby blends i've tried introducing finger foods and transition meals he spits them out he will chew or eat some puffs I feel like he's behind. He's not getting the hang of eating and chewing. He eats purees at mealtime, but doesn't seem overly eager or wanting solids. I think that it's also okay, Ali, for him to just not be ready at something. There's no behind. So behind is not really a thing, right? Development is on this nice, very, very generous spectrum. And it is okay if he comes to finger foods later. There's no reason to think that he won't come around to eating all, all kinds of things eventually. So this small window feels behind, but I would not say behind at all. I would continue to offer them. So maybe you do some of the things he likes in a puree form and some of the things he likes as finger food, and you continue to offer it to see what he's interested in. And if you have one meal of just finger food and he doesn't eat as much, you have your backup He's still only 10 months old, so he's still getting calories elsewhere. And then if you stick with it for a few meals, he may come around. So he may be like, it's not my favorite choice. And if there's a million other things here, I'm going to choose those. But if it's the only choice, I might be more willing to try it. So I would experiment a little bit with instead of getting him to choose it, to just continue to offer it. My baby is 36 weeks and we're barely, you must mean months and we're barely starting solids. Is that too late? So, I not too late, nothing's too late. There's never too late. Just go ahead and start whenever you feel you're ready and you want to start solids, no problem. Um, and then I would just say in terms of the allergens, if there's anything you're particularly concerned about that you're adding late, that might be the only thing that, that would, would make it late at all. Should water only be given during mealtime? You don't really need water at other times during the day at the four to six month range because they are getting so many liquids through breast milk and formula, but totally fine once you've introduced water to try small sips throughout the rest of the day, but specifically around mealtime, Tracy, if it's early on. What type of water is recommended? Purified, home filtered. That anonymous person um, is a good question for a local practitioner. There are different recommendations, I think, depending on where you live about tap water or filtered water, but I do not know all of those. My apologies. My recommendations for skipping the sippy cup. That's exactly what I'm recommending, Janani. So skip the sippy cup. 
you have bottles, bottles have nipples, they're doing, or you have nipples on your boobs. So they're doing enough nipple sucking, you move them to the straw cup or an open cup. How do you teach them to drink from the straw cup? That is what's very, that is where the multiple cups of all different varieties come from, of trying to figure out which cup is best for them, which one they can actually figure out and which one doesn't spill. So it, it does take some trial and error. If you're noticing that you need, they do make some straw cups for babies who have more trouble sucking. Um, so there are lots of products out there that can help, but it is a little bit of trial and error. My baby will be six months in a few days, showing all the signs of readiness, but cannot sit up independently yet. Do we wait? Again, I would say what sitting up looks like for you and whether you feel like it would be unsafe and a choking risk, that would be what I would be most concerned about. So again, if you have somebody who sees your baby in person who can assess that for you, that would probably be great. Is there a baby led weeding meal planner with recommended foods? There are so many of them. Um, social media has a lot of different ways to look at options for baby led weaning if you're looking for ideas and recipes. Um, and it sounds like you could use um, the little spoons feature of their finger foods to see what else is, is out there that's popular with the finger food crowd. Just started purees when I can, when can I introduce puffs or teethers? Can I do flavors they haven't tried? You can definitely do flavors, Amanda. You can do puffs, oh, I mean, very early on. Again, most of the puffs, and, and you'd wanna make sure you buy the puffs that dissolve in their mouths and that they just sort of gum around, but working on that fine motor scale is great to start. Gabby, I've seen in Solid Starts app that cheese should be served after 12 months. I don't know what the reasoning is about that. I have not heard that, Gabby. So I am not aware in that particular um, app if that's something, I obviously know the app, but I don't know if their cheese recommendation is about something particular to baby led weaning or to the style that they are recommending, but not in terms of allergens or other nutrition. Have I ever read that there was an issue with cheese before 12 months. No, sorry, Grace, no honey. I'm I was just saying with the exception of honey and drinking straight cow's milk, those are still the two foods that are not recommended for babies under a year old. And just so you know, the, the risk of botulism with honey has not been shown to decrease even when we stopped recommending babies uh, to have honey, but still we continue to recommend no honey. Solids went really well at four months. Recently started engaging in tongue thrusts at 13 months. Um, I would ask the pediatrician about any change that you're noticing in your child after having successfully eaten that's sort of impacting their eating later on. Brianna, how many times a day should you offer food? De depends on the age of your child. And again, thinking through like what works for your schedule and what is possible for you to do. The quantities are really small, so it may be really small quantities more frequently or just one time of day that works. When offering a utensil, can you do this while spoon feeding purees? Is the goal to have them hold the utensil? Yes. So Jessica, the goal is for them to hold the utensil while you're doing feeding so that they are learning about the utensil and so that they may begin to explore using it for themselves. So as someone else had mentioned, you can do the load it up and give it back to them, but that's not really as much the purpose as for them to just begin to imitate and see how you do it. And the holding of utensils and introducing utensils around food is also so that they can just understand all of the accoutrement of meals and how it works and what's going on way before they can use it. Tracy, I see your hand, but are you able to unmute yourself? Potentially not. So just put the question in Q&A. Sorry about that, everybody, if you can't unmute yourself and I told you to unmute yourself. Allie, how do you navigate having one mealtime with your child given that he goes to daycare and how they set up feeding is out of your control? So Allie, I'm not sure I know your question. Like, how can you control that people are having a meal time with your child and that you're doing a meal together? I would ask the daycare. Daycares are great for socializing around meals because usually everybody's eating at the same time and a lot of the kids will be sitting together and the adult who's helping them eat is probably at the table with all of them. So likely if that's what you were worried about, they're getting that experience at daycare. Um, even for 
kids in their elementary school, tween, teen years, were only ever talking about trying to eat four meals a week together as a family. So if your child, if you're working full time and your child is in daycare and you never see them for meals, you can use the, the weekends to think about having quality interactions with each other. So maybe it's your two meals, one each day on the weekend, and that's where you get that opportunity. So if that, hopefully that's what your question was about, but if not, throw another one in the Q&A. What size is bite size? the size of a baby's fist. But once he takes a bite, it's small again. Oh, Joni, help me out. I don't know if I understand. Bite size is not the size of a baby's fist. So maybe you had heard a portion, but even that is, is too big a portion for what we're talking about. So I'm not sure about the, the fist part of the question, Bonnie. Put Put another question back in, in Q&A so I can understand. The bite size is more like the size of a thumbnail, right? Like an adult thumbnail that you can think about with bite size. And again, thinking of whether it's a squishy food, what the textures of the food to appropriately size it. Um, will the slides be available in the recording? I think we will be making the recording and the, and the slides available and we will have a handout. I think we've answered this question about having no interest in finger foods. So we're gonna still keep trying to offer them and introduce them. And, and again, varying what you have at different meals so that your child doesn't always have to you know, choose between something they love and something that's new, but having a mix um, of different meals and different names. What's the deal with salt and babies? Um, I, again, it depends on the style of feeding you're doing. If you're feeding your children the same food that you eat, then obviously you're not going to be cooking necessarily with no salt in your food, same as no spices and no other um, ingredients. So um, I think Rebecca, it it no added salt is recommended for babies. Probably you can look on Little Spoon for more recommendations around specific baby foods. But if you are doing something like baby led weaning and your children are eating the same meals you are, then um, I think that advice would be different. Can I still give my baby milk while giving him iron? Does milk lower iron absorption? I'm not sure if you're talking about cow's milk, Priscilla, but we're not talking about the switch for cow's milk and, and regular meals um, in this case. So iron supplementation is largely for breastfeeding babies in the first year. And if you're continuing, if you're moving to cow's milk, you can talk about other um, fortified milk and other sources of iron. When introducing water, what's the recommended amount? Up to eight ounces, two ounces a day. I wouldn't count the number of ounces, Jessica, that your baby is eating. And it definitely isn't an eight ounce glass of water, at, again, in these early months. So you're just working on small sips. So I think probably the two ounces total is, is more um, accurate, but I would also say just offering it and offering small sips is what you're working on right now in this moment in time, although I don't know how old your baby is, but in general, um, you can think about just offering it, not calculating or, or looking at quantity quite, quite as much. Okay, we've, we've talked about allergens. We've had a lot of feeding challenges. I worry they'll generalize eating in the future. What is recommended to improve positive associations? That's a great question. So we do know that negative associations with, with eating can um, contribute to disordered eating and unhealthy eating and um, even obesity in the future. So things like mindless eating where we distract our children and they eat sort of involuntarily, right? So they're looking at something over here and then we shove food in their face and that forcing, um, it does have a link to obesity because we basically don't allow our children the opportunity to practice self-regulation and stopping when they're full. We sort of break that hard wiring that meant for many of us is broken, which is the ability to stop when we're full, right, and not keep eating. I talk about it like a bucket of popcorn at the movie theater, where if you're just distracted, you will continue to eat. But that's eating that you're not regulating, that you're not checking in with your body and seeing your sense of fullness and what that's like. So there's lots of data around that in terms of other negative associations. So that pressure to eat, the battle for control, um, any of those struggles that you may have had, the best way to think about working on those is to work on positive connections. So not only at mealtime, but throughout the day. So having 
low stress, meaningful interactions with your child where you work to be responsive to their needs, to make that connection, to have delight and joy in them and share those moments that can all work to rebuild that sort of positive attachment relationship. And then bringing that into eating, um, Siddika, I'm probably butchering your name, I apologize, but Siddika would bring all of that into eating and make mealtimes really low stress, really fun, really a moment for connection, and then have the food there and available. So the food is secondary to all of the wonderful things that are happening at mealtime. But yes, if you've noticed that, it's a really great thing to get on and to try to make a positive association with food instead of that pressured, um, pressured eating subscription box. Um, I'm going to leave that question. I know that uh, Karen had to run from Little Spoons, but I don't know if there are other subscription box options for them or how, how that, that actually works. Since it's just for experience, how do I make sure they get enough? Sometimes I worry he's too full for solids. Well, you don't have to, Janani, you don't have to worry if he's getting enough because you have your bottles or breast milk to feel good about general nutrition. So it can just be about fun and exploration. And then as you transition or wean off of formula or breast milk, then you can sort of focus more on how much volume your child is eating. But remember that volume also changes over time. So in the growth spurts that kids have, there are times where they need more calories than others. There's times where their appetite drops off. So it's not a sort of measurable thing over time, the way you might feel about like ounces in a bottle. And I think that's an adjustment for parents more than it is for your children. But again, the control and satisfaction, we feel it being like, you drank exactly 37 ounces today and I could see it all and I knew exactly what it was. We have to give up some of that control when it comes to things like starting solids so that our kids can also be able to explore and go through this in a sort of gentle way and not make it about regulating um, calories in and calories out. So I know we're at time. I'm so sorry that there are so many more questions. Um, I will keep these and we will definitely be answering more of them. We can answer them on Instagram. We have an email newsletter that you can sign up for. So come to yourcooper.com, make sure that you sign up and we will um, get back to answering some of these amazing questions. There are so many of them. And thank you, Joni, and, and for doing this together. This was fun. Yeah. Uh, just, I wasn't sure if the chat was working. So our the link to the NARA baby app is narababy.com. And I know that Karen want to offer first time customers, um, a coupon code for a little spoon and the coupon code is Cooper 50. So and I think in your handout, you're all automatically get a handout and it has the NARA app information, a code for Cooper and a code for little spoon. So we are going to email that to you very promptly after this talk. I actually have one quick question. Oh yeah. Um, embracing the mess of starting solids. That's yeah. something I have to work on. And I heard that I should not be wiping the kid's mouth all the time. You should not be. Because that, is that like a, what does it do? Does it create some type of association for the baby or does it, is it just really distracting? It's just part of the sensory experience. So okay. feeling it on their skin, in their fingers and squishing is part of the experience of food. And we want to give them that and that's how they learn. So they can't learn about what it feels like without that experience. And if we, we restrict them from being messy by wiping them constantly and you know cleaning them mid bite, we just interrupt all of that learning because food is about, again, so much more than just the like in the mouth swallow. So don't worry about manners. Nobody worry about manners, embrace the mess, embrace it all over them um, and let them have that experience. Hardest That's a great, part. thank you for it. <laughs> Hardest part, letting it me, a, not having that control and just letting them go to, go to town with the food. <laughs> Totally. So much of this is about what we're used to and, and our expectations of ourselves. So it's really great to remember that there are real reasons that we should let it go if we can. Yeah. Thank you for this great, great discussion. Thank you all. Thank you to so many of you for joining and have a wonderful rest of the day. And I hope to see you at Cooper. Bye, guys. Bye.